Hello, everybody. Whoops, I'm, I'm going to switch the screen here. Switch screen, because I'm not Steven. That's Steven. So, hello to Suzanne Off the Cuff. I have a return guest today, my friend Steven. And let me know if you're getting any echo. I'm always paranoid about echo, so let me know if you hear any echo. But um, Stephen is back because of popular demand and because we love Stephen. We all love Stephen. <laughs> and uh, he's got quite a bit in store for you today. I think it's going to be really, really fun. And we're going to start. I'm not going to go through and welcome everybody because he's got so much he's going to talk about today that I don't think that um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a good show today. I'm so excited about it. But anyway... I'm going to turn it over. Oh, Stephen, I can't hear you. Oh, no. I can't hear you. There we go. Yes. Yay. Okay. So I I'm going go you know. to turn it over to Stephen, and he has a special guest that he's going to interview. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm very grateful for the fact that you are taking time to spend it with myself and Suzanne this afternoon. Um, the world is experiencing a lot of things right now. And um, I say, thank goodness I have my yarn and my knitting. And so I'm not so much, I'm not a precise knitter um, and teacher as Suzanne is. Um, I focus on inspiration and I like to inspire people. Maybe you're comfortable already with the way you knit. And I don't know, some people repeat the same thing over and they make 20 cable sweaters or whatever. And so if you're feeling that at all, this is the perfect opportunity for you. Um, it's gonna be kind of a teaser today because I am um, holding a class uh, on the first. I put it up, it's called, it's my color workshop with Steven and it sold out on all that day, Sunday. So um, honestly, if anyone is interested in, after I'm done and you're interested in that color workshop, um, then I will maybe add a second session if you're interested. I can add that today. Um, Joy, can you get me the that knitter's palette, color palette artist thing? Uh -huh. And Joy's my right hand, my left hand. Oh, it's in the green book in there. Oh. And um, and so I'll add a second session. Then on the what day is it? 29th? The second class. Next class, and it's going to be uh, the short row session. And I mean, it's knit it in a minute. Sorry, knit it in a minute. So that's going to be how I knit with my big needles and combining yarn. So I'm going to tease you with some of those samples today. And um, we're going to include crochet. So I don't know if any of you are use both needles, um, hooks and needles, but um, I like to. Uh, make it accessible for all fiber lovers. And um, my shop is one that doesn't raise their nose at crocheters, I embrace them. Because some of the things that um, we knit, I recreate in crochet and they look so similar. Unfortunately, a lot of um, the memory of crochet is that ripple afghan on the back of Roseanne's sofa on the TV show, right? Or the 70s show. And really crochet has become beautiful in the last few years. Um, we've really blossomed. Anyway, um, my color workshop on the first is going to use this Stephen B. Artist palette of color. So we're going to talk about the color. I mean, some of you, this is, seems to be the most popular, let's see, on this side, the purple, I gotta, this is backwards for me, purple and blue. And that's where a lot of people go. And everybody loves, where is it? Yellow. Oh, the other way. Yellow but people hardly ever buy yellow yarn. So we're gonna talk about that. And I might force you to use a color you don't like. Um, it really opens up sometimes the box that we put ourselves in, knitting rules, you know, knitting rules. This is right, this is wrong. I never say wrong to anyone. Uh, my motto is there are no mistakes, only variations, okay? Um, and that really, if you think about that every time it comes along, it really sets you free a bit. And Suzanne's probably cringing right now, but. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I love it. 
Okay, if you can't see it galloping by on a horse, then I don't figure it matters. Um, because if we focus on one little stitch down there that we, I don't know, twisted or it's bigger than the others or we forgot a yarn over, um, no one's going to really notice it. But I know as knitters, we point it out. You know, if someone compliments you on a shawl and the first thing you do is, I know, but I dropped the stitch right here. Exactly. And I didn't ask that. Um, but because when you look at something, it's the overall effect that the piece has, and which is true in choosing yarns uh, and colors. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, I'm going to tease you with my short row session, um, which I'm going to go and elaborate more on in the color workshop. So that will be our project. That will be our project for the short row color workshop. And if this is my artful short rose cowl, take note of that. Joy might put it up on, um, or Suzanne can, on chat, um, artful short rose cowl. And if you sign up for my emails, go to my stephenb.com and you sign up to get my emails, let me know that you have and I'll send you this for free. Okay? That's beautiful. I love it. So for me, this is beautiful. It's a simple, easy gift, and we don't have to make only blue hats. We can let our creativity flow and use yarns that we have. Anybody have yarn at home, extra? <laughs> Thought I'd ask. Um, um, and I know that you refer to it as a stash, but that seems a little bit putting it down. So I call it fine art collection. And I'm the curator of my own fine art collection. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, to me, that illuminates it. It puts, them, it puts it into a museum quality. And because um, Lord knows the price you paid for some of those yarns, right? Mm -hmm. And um, really, what's the difference between a dyer that's dyeing a skein of wool, painting on it, and there's some amazing independent dyers out there right now. And what's the difference between that and someone using watercolor and candle? Hold on, we have a little bit of an echo, Stephen. Let me figure it out. Okay, it might be you. I'm sorry. Oh, did you invite Joy yet, Suzanne? Yes, I did. Okay. And then she's getting ready to put Mama on. Okay. Anybody know Mama Krista from the social media? It's funny because I do videos with her and she has no idea what's going on. And I tell her she got a thousand likes and she's like, what does that mean? And I put purple short rows and your fine art collection. I figure if you use up one batch of leftovers or a skein you've always had, the yarn shop rules, my rules are you can go buy two new ones. Use one up. <laughs> buy right. two new ones. Exactly. Okay, see the math? See the math? Yeah. Okay. So this is the Artful Short Rows. And then I'm going to show you how I elaborated on it in a bit. All right, well, let me show you now. No, let me, let's talk to So as um, soon as Joy's on and has mom available, there she is, JW. I haven't seen her picture yet, though. No. And uh, this has been wonderful with Sudan because I'm learning so much about um, all this internet teaching and and so my class is going to be on zoom and my friend john giswold in new york who runs knits from the pit if you're free on saturday friday nights it comes from new york from asbury park and it's a wonderful group of knitters and he's been so generous in in having me on um he's gonna like be my tech moderator for my class in case anything comes up because i did um the first session of vogue and um on Sunday, my internet failed and it was a disaster. Okay. So whenever you get one of those moves, remember this. <laughs> <laughs> so your mom is available now. Would you like to talk with her? Yes. Um, so this is my mama, Krista. Um, she came to live with me about uh, three years ago from her home in Wisconsin to an, smile, mom. 
Smile. There you go. Whoops. So mama came to live with me. Um, she will be having her 89th birthday this week. So we thought we'd have her on and give a bit of what I call ancient knitting history. Um, she was around uh, during World War II in Germany and um, has some tales to tell, which could go on all day. Perhaps we should write a book. Um, but mom, do you remember like when you first started knitting? How old were you? Oh, we learned in school the first year. Oh, so you that, that would have been 1937 or so. If we can all remember back that far. Probably not that <laughs> long way went there and no, went. What kind of yarn did you have? I went all the way to Germany during the war. What kind of yarn did you guys use? We always couldn't buy yarn anymore when the war was on. And then my father worked in a company. Would they made uh, horses for, we thought, for... Uh, for the, oh, for, yeah, so you used other things instead of yarn? Is that where they worked with the company? Stuff for the. Uh, Watch it. it. Watches, but they were timers. That was a different factory. What about the. Oh, the watches, the watch bands? What about the parachute factory? Do you remember the parachute factory? Well, I just remember the parachute coming down on my face. No. So what kind of things and did you get? It, and then we had to go and see what it was, and so we went over, and there was a mm. exploded one, and then later <laughs> on I went to East Germany. Oh, and okay. You were in East Germany, but what did you knit, Mom? Uh, it was uh, yarn was left over. To do that. Okay. What kind of things did you knit? What was just did uh, you knit underwear? Underwear. <laughs> Stephen said you knit underwear. <laughs> yeah, underwear with cotton and uh, for the chest. Sweater. Bra. Sweaters. Sweaters for oh, undershirts. Yeah, undershirts. Undershirts, and then my dad would uh, all the people who worked in that they would throw the little bits out, and the women knew that. Ah. So they went out and got it. They couldn't use it for the big, the big stuff. stuff. So for the weaving, that, mill, for the that, weaving. Mill. Yeah. Was the thing. But then later on, I went to West Germany because I met a guy. From, <laughs> um, was he a, was he a handsome guy? Was he Stephen's dad? Handsome <laughs> guy <and> <laughs> Some if I would go talking to you. I think that should be in the tell-all book. And uh, he said he'd want nothing other than having me talk to him because he was lonely, lonely and he was an American boy. Yeah. First yeah. time I stood him up because I didn't like the <laughs> name Charlie. And then the next Sunday we came out and he had time off too. And I said, oh, I couldn't come. He said, I know I saw you <laughs> when I came to pick you up. That was the beginning of... And you were on a date with another guy. <laughs> that was the beginning of the You always had two dates at once. <laughs> you told me that was the rule. Always have an option. Yeah. So anyhow, uh, did you knit when you went to West Germany? In West Germany. Did you knit when you the went to West Germany? Were you knitting there? Uh, I'm, I'm, he said, I don't want nothing about from you except if I can just talk to you. You talk so nice and I, I can. Well, the next Sunday he was there again and said the same thing. <laughs> so I said, well, we can try it again. So he's a smooth talker like your son. He took you to the U.S., and, right? <laughs> And then I eventually uh, repeat my thing. Yep. He, he, Just interrupt her. That okay. was in West Germany. He, he, okay. What, Stephen? He took you. He took you to the U.S. Right? He, he, 
he brought you he brought you here yeah nice I, and you lived i know you lived in bemidji and all well, over the place he, the, 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 well they were in germany for half half a year he extended to half a year and then he took me to germany to so when you went to the u.s what Boston? year when did you open and, your uh, shop joy there i could work again i could buy yarn that i wanted i didn't have to look for my dad's the, what they had left over and that made, made the people try to knit and pick that up okay let's wrap this up then okay. uh, when where was your shop mom where was your shop uh, big shop Wisconsin. And how many years? Oh. 40, well, 44 years. Actually, and full. But we just wrapped it up and closed it down three years ago when she moved up with me. So, this is Mama Krista. Watch. Watch we have videos together on Instagram and social media. And you'll see she is my inspiration. She's why I'm in this business. And at one point I said, mom, what should I do with the rest of my life? And she said, she threw a bag of yarn at me and said, here, sell some yarn. <laughs> and I, 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 mom, I said, mom, I'm VP of a big company in New York. I can't open a yarn shop, but what's that gonna look like? And she says, oh, get humble already. And um, she said, besides your inheritance is coming in bags of 10. <laughs> There's, there's no cash. Even it's all yarn. <laughs> and I got it three years ago. And Joy can testify how much it is. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. And my house is still full of it. Anyway, thank you, Mama. Thanks for joining us. Say hey, baby. Bye. Bye, dear. <laughs> okay. So that's Mama you. Krista. And um, she inspires me every day. And she's German, so she challenges me every day. <laughs> that that hardcore um, German stoicness and perseverance has not left, even though the mind is going. Um, anyway, so she's my inspiration. She's why I have a yarn shop today. When I didn't have money to pay the yarn bills, she paid them for me. And um, I inherited four truckloads of yarn three years ago. Wow. My shop, my shop lower level is filled. For, it's waiting for processing. My, I have a billiard room in my Victorian house. is filled with um, yarn. We don't play billiard anyway. And um, we do have a value hallway and a value vault at Stephen B. So if you're over here, 30 and 50% off. And we've got everything that no one has anymore. Um, I get emailed all the time requesting certain yarns, and by golly, most of the time I have. So um, I digress greatly, but um, that's how I am. And we were talking about short rows. Um, so I'm going to start showing you some additional short row samples. But the point being, I'm going to give you a brief overview today on the short rows. And then Joy's going to get me the winder up here because I'm going to do a little um, glimpse winding thing. And uh, that was, um, hold on, that was um, Suzanne who? Margo. Margo, yes, I knew it was Anne. Margo um, asked about it, so um, we're gonna do that. And it's very special and it's so tricky, it's so good. Some people, when I show it, they say, oh, that was worth the price of the class. Um, anyway, my short row in this, there's the German short row, um, so in my class, I'm going to demonstrate the differences. And I always did the wrap and turn. And for those of you that are more precise, um, you, you count that stitch when you wrap it around and then you put it back and it's a pearl row. So which way do you wrap it? Well, I happen to be the person that like, oh, screw this. Um, so mine are called lazy short rows. And um, just, I'm literal and honest. Um, and I do them, and I think that it works well. Um, I'm not saying the other ones are wrong. It's just my way of 
So if you take this cowl and make it in any color combination, and this is going to be our project for um, my workshop on the first, which is full. But if anybody's interested, there's a lot of you on today. So I don't know if I get 10 people or so, we'll do a second episode. Um, I don't know if you can see it closely, but I see I throw a few rows of sparkle in there. Yeah. And um, if I'm bored, you're giving me the winder, right? And some silk, or I can use some of that ram. And see, I put sequins in there. Just a little treat. It's a treat. And I don't do anything symmetrical, and nothing matches, and nothing's perfect. I don't believe in perfection. Um, because they say na nature's perfect, but then nothing's symmetrical and even in nature, right? Anyway, that's my theory. So when I take that yarn for those cowls that I have here, it's a mini kit like this. And then maybe I'll add some from my own stash because I'm always sprinkling in some spice um, with my project. And I thought this was a bit garish. Um, so I turned it into this. And many of you will still think this is garish. But um, I toned down the colors a bit. And I don't know, the colors aren't showing up that great on the screen, but um, it's much clearer than it's showing up. Let me see what I can do with that. Hold on. It might be, it might be just my screen because I'm getting a little delay anyway. Um, so what I did was run, whenever in doubt, whenever in doubt, grab a mohair. Oh yeah, that color is way off. Um, this is turquoise. Um, whenever in doubt, grab a mohair, because what I believe that mohair does, it's like, um, watercolor paints. It, it, you can see through it, it changes, it mutes things, it halos things, um, and adds it can actually change the flavor. So you can see the difference, I think, between that and that. And some of you may like the brighter, and that's fine. Um, and I wish you could see this in its true color, but um, it just came out a little more soft. And that's all because of the black mohair that I added. And I ran them simultaneously. Um, I've done this for years, and you'll see many of my projects have that in. Um, and so if your pattern's calling for a worsted weight and um, maybe you have a sport or DK, make it a worsted by running a strand of mohair with it. And that's a very popular technique right now. Some of the uh, um, Ravelry's knitting stars like Andrew Mowry have picked up on that and Stephen West, and they've done a lot of things with that. So it's very popular right now. We're selling a ton of mohair. This is my, wait. Is that right? Yeah, that's my own brand. Look, it has my face on it. Does it kind of look like me? Um, has my face on it. It's called Binge Knit. So they're all named after those favorite shows that you like to binge watch on Netflix or whatever you have, Amazon. or. And uh, we have a fingering, a, a DK weight, a worsted weight, and a mohair so far. And the colors are amazing because I did them. Oh, well, I didn't mean that. Um, the colors <laughs> because my staff did them. Um, and it's used for sweaters and shawls and, and anything you can think of. It's a really great oh. utilitarian yarn. Merino and... And Missy is answering questions. Oh, Missy's helping answer questions in yeah. chat, if you have any. I don't know how she's doing that, but you know the tech side of it. She's on here. She's in the chat. Yeah, so this is, this is my... So, Theory on mohair. Okay, so short rows. Um, most of you probably have done short rows. Suzanne, do you teach a class on short rows? Yes. Which one do you use? Um, I teach all of them, but the one that I personally use is wrap and turn. Okay. Um, so what else is there? I know there's like Japanese and German. I don't know. There's probably Hungarian and Yugoslavian. I don't know. Um, everybody's got a unique way of doing things, right? And I think everybody can sign on with me that I don't think there's no right or wrong. Um, it could become a preference. Uh, 
but a lot of us like to try new things. So people come to me that um, knit English style or throw knitting, and they come to me and want to learn um, continental or pip knitting, as they call it. My theory is, and I don't know, Suzanne, if I'm right on this, but uh, the pip knitting, which I do from my mother in Germany, so it's called continental because it was on the continent of Europe, primarily. And it's not 100% true. And then the Brit Isles, they were the ones that did the throw knitting and the Scottish and all that. Some hold it under their arm. And so I've got a lady that holds it between her legs, um, the needle. So there's, you know, a cup of tea for everyone. Um, what do you think about that, Suzanne, that theory? Um, I think that that's probably true, too. I'm a continental knitter or picker. And, and it's, you know, I think it's the fastest way to knit because it's economy of motion. You're not moving your hands very much to do it. And for people who have arthritis and things, I think it's it's better for your joints. But you can knit however you want to knit, as long as the stitches right. turn out right. Um, so that's, that's my project for the workshop. And we're going to do a little bit on that today. If anybody of you has any yarn by you and a needle, uh, if you want to play along with me, you can. Uh, I don't know, cast on 20 stitches and knit a row. Uh, and let's do it in garter. Um, no rush, and if you don't have it, it's no big deal. Who doesn't have yarn by their side? <laughs> All right. Then when you take that project and you elaborate on it, you go one step further, you get... Wow. Uh, you know, and, and my theory on this is that once you get the gist of it, I don't follow the directions every row. I get a vibe of how the short rows work. And it was called swing knitting originally in Germany. Okay. And the idea of swing knitting is she loved swing jazz. Um, the original person that made all of this so popular, and I, her name escapes me at the moment. And, um, and then um, a lady here in the US asked permission if she could grow on that. And so she's done all of these. Um, and her name escapes me for the minute too. And uh, she's done all these. Oh, no, um, oh, no the one before her. Oh. And then someone here in town, Barban, my dear Barban, um, elaborated even more on it. And she's Stephen Beta. So she's picked all different fibers and sparkle. And so you can see this is a way. Um, does anybody have those single skeins of fingering? Maybe you picked up at the shop pop right here. Try this? at the shop hop or yarn crawl or that trip to um, I don't know Seattle and then all of a sudden you've got all these single skeins of yarn and like what are you doing making socks well not that many people knit all that fingering up in socks so we've used it for shawl right but what if you only have one so see how it doesn't matter one skein of blue one skein of red and I'm really big on um, only shopping for your favorite things instead of what the pattern says. Right. And I make it work. So who says that? Tim Gunn. Make it work. Um, I think I said that before. Anyway, um, you can really use what you own and then go in, continue to support your local yarn shop and embellish what you already own. So people come to me with, I've got this yarn, I bought it like 10 years ago, and now I kind of find it boring, what should I do with it? So I w work with a lot of people on that. So this is um, one step further than the cowl that I showed you. Um, and the short rows don't all have to be in those um, pod shapes. This is also, okay? Great way to use up your remnants. They're really fun. You don't have to have full skeins of anything. You just make it work. And um, it's a gift that you can give and people will go, wow, you made that? Because non-knitters don't understand, right? What goes into this stuff. Um, so that's a great one. This one is called, I think Missy made this one. Um, Simple Sprinkle by Vera Balacoma. I don't care. I'm sorry if I mess up names. Um, isn't that fun? Yes. So are, are you all starting to feel about the value of what you already own? Yes. Okay. And um, I was going to show you something today, but 
um, let's just use this. Pretend this is a, a picture out of a magazine you pulled out because you love the colors. And some people store their yarn by weight, some by color, as many ways, in those plastic tubs under your bed, in your closet, in the basement. Um, but take out a magazine picture and look at all the colors in that magazine picture because if you like the photograph, you'll probably like how the colors go together. And that's how I plan my projects. Um, I've done it so much, so now I just pick it because I'm, you know, years of experience. But um, that's how you're going to get new combinations. And you're going to pretend it's the Arctic Circle and you've got ivory and, and you're thinking Arctic Circle. Oh, that's white snow. Well, if you look at a picture, there's much more to it. There's grays and there's browns and there's navy in it and, and the different shades of beige and white. Um, and the uh, Amazon, you know, the greens and the water, the blue. Well, there may be a toucan in the tree and all of a sudden it's orange and yellow matter. Um, and that's how I look at my projects. And I'm going to culminate this with um, my favorite Amazon shawl. Okay? Don't forget, this is the color workshop. I'm going to read your colors. I'll read your beads. Um, and um, suggest colors you could be using or looking at. And most of the people that take the workshop go, they talk about, oh my God, now I go somewhere shopping and I look totally different at things. And it's not just meant for yarn, household appliances, the color of car you own, how you're gonna decorate your room. I saw an ad for a, a interior um, store that does interiors and the whole room was beige with brown wooden accents. And I'm like, you need some balls of yarn in there. So I decorate with my balls of yarn. I have a big bowl on my coffee table with ostrich eggs I brought back from South Africa. And then I mix it with wound up balls of yarn. Um, old school hooks in my entryway, you know, like the kids, Laura Ingalls Wilder, they hung their coats on the wall. I, ha I hang my skeins from there, my hanks, and um, change them whenever I'm in a bad mood or seasonally or whatever. My bro yarn brings me joy and should be celebrated, not hidden under the basement stairs, okay? I'm adding the class right now. Um, Joy's adding the class on my website, she tells me. And then I'm going to show you how to wind. Um, I just here, put, if people go to your website, they can sign up for your newsletter there. And they, you also have a contact me where they can actually contact you if they need yeah, to. Yeah, info at. Yep. See how this works in every great color? When you're doing this, though, make sure that this accent color does not match exactly or does not um, blend in, pick the, a bigger contrast as you can because you won't see it. And I'll show you now. That's this, a big problem uh, people have. They like to match their yarns together. Okay. And when you're Everybody in this workshop, if yeah. you got a little more paper by you right here, write down the word matching and then underneath just and then underneath that only. Write those three words down because they're important to me. Got them written down? Okay, now cross them out. <laughs> because they're not important to me. That's the easiest way of remembering it. So matching, uh, let's think of some other words. Um, coordinating, complementing, accenting. There's a lot of other words. So throw that w matching word right out the window. Because the when you hold two skeins together, that's not how your project's going to look. You got two big clumps of yarn, okay? Um, especially if you're doing single rows of garter or something, and I'm gonna show you that later on too, okay? Um, but this is my most popular. And this is the Papillon. And I forget the designer's name because I have no brain retention anymore. What's <laughs> oh, on the tag, thank you. Marin, oh, I couldn't say it anyway. Mel Choir, Choir. Anyway, it starts up here and it works back and forth. And we use one cell striping yarn. This is by Earth. Oh, where is it? There. And then we use one contrast yarn. And see how this, uh, yeah, that, I want the acid green that's in the shawl because it makes it pop. Otherwise, it's too muted. So think of those things because the skein itself looks okay. But 
when you see the single rows, uh, right, where I'm really bad at this, I gotta get used to that. Right here, you need that electricity to make it stand out. Otherwise it, it would blend in, especially in other places in the shawl. So remember that this, um, this kit's available for me in like limit, unlimited colorways. I know I'm running out of time. I'm too slow, right, Suzanne? No, you're doing awesome. Okay, so this is the, and then we turned it into a poncho. Barban did this, Barban's brilliant. Um, she can take any short row project and make it into something else. So um, this is her own design. And who doesn't love a poncho? Come on. I made them in the 70s. Anybody remember that? We crocheted them. Yep. Um, three double crochet clusters with a chain in between, and then you put the other one, oh, yeah. And then I put fringe on them. And then we did a, a monk, we call it a monk's cord, I don't know if that's true, for the neckline and put pom-poms on the end. <laughs> it's kind of my motto, pom-poms, glitter, sprinkles, oh my. You know, anything that embellishes um, from the Wizard of Oz. But um, I, I put in for the uh, Urban Dictionary, uh, Stephen B as a transitive verb, meaning to take something further than it was intended to go. So you could Stephen be your project, you can Stephen be your kitchen, um, you could Stephen be your hair. Um, we were, we were, you know, well, some of us were born with a certain color. Um, <laughs> and that sparkle fairy hair, right? Mine was blue until recently. Um, when the COVID hit and uh, it was so hard to keep it blue and I'm just like kind of let it go back. But I've got, where is it? Oh yes, I've got fashionable salt and pepper sideburns now. I'm celebrating them. Um, this is the poncho. Okay, so Stephen B, a transitive verb, wait, well, meaning to take something further than it was intended to go. And then, so I don't like, if I don't like this big neckline, and I don't wear anything symmetrical, keep that in mind. You know, everybody wants to put the point down the center. Oh my God, one time I did a fashion show for Vogue. And um, the lady in charge was like, before the model went out, she was measuring to make sure it was perfectly centered. And then I went up in the front and just turned everything askew. <laughs> I never got hired again. Um, because I think, you know, your face is not symmetrical. It really isn't. Your feet aren't the same size. We're not that perfect. And um, I just enjoy you know, a different shape. So Stephen B, a transitive verb. And then um, uh, the gentleman that passed away that was quite well respected in the, uh, John Lewis. Um, I was listening to the funeral today and they were talking about the word B. And of course with Stephen B, it means a lot because my favorite yarn company when I opened was B Sweet. And I saw our other guest has um, uh, some B Sweet yarn. So when I opened the store, B Sweet sent me a bouquet of flowers and it said, B Sweet, B Sweet loves Stephen B. And I'm like, what happened? And the florist said, well, I couldn't fit the RG from your last name on there, so I just left it B. And I went, oh my God, that's perfect. And hence, well, I, plus I always wanted to be a star and like I wanted one name like Cher, Madonna, Sting. And now I have it, Stephen B. Um, but anyway, in John Lewis' funeral today, he used the word B a lot because B is a joining verb. It joins. Um, uh, and that is so much what we're about here. Um, knitters are unique, eccentric, individual, all things to be celebrated. And Stephen B loves bringing all that energy together. It also is an action verb. So I'm all about action and I'm all about being busy and doing 42 things at once. So if you take one of my classes, don't expect a structured outline with precision. We try a lot of things and we mix and match and we experiment. And um, I sent out the kits because I did a little kit for each per, uh, student in the workshop. Oh, it looks like this. You get mini balls of my choice and we're gonna learn how to mix these all together. So on this mini project, you can take that back. You can take that back. 
Sorry. You can, take, you can take that back to your stash and replicate it. No, I needed music. I got music. Um, and then I throw in some fun things like these feathers with metal tips on them. So we're going to add those in. And tassels. I love tassels, pom poms, and fringe. And look at these beads I put in. So we're going to talk about using those. Um, anyway, back to my sample. <laughs> I digress constantly. Um, I have another version of this. This is my feeder brook, a classic. Um, for those of a serious nature color palette, like all my friends in New York. Oh, it's beautiful. That only wear black and gray. Oh, that's so beautiful. But see how, see the pop of color? The yellow just, it, it just makes it, the black and gray more interesting, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that is this wonderful yarn from Lisa, from, oh, there's the label. Feederbrook Farms, and we do a lot with her because it's very, she was a, the original, if you've all heard of Spin Cycle, um, they've been very popular recently, and um, she was the originator of this technique, and they did it slightly different. There's this much tighter spun, and this is Blueface Lester, so when you knit with it, do not knit it tight. All of my projects are more of accessories, non-fitting, easy to wear projects. So my gauge, um, well, I'm gonna do a class on gauge uh, and all my tips and tricks. My gauge techniques are probably not like Suzanne's. I always go up a needle size bigger. I want my yarn to drape and flow um, because I don't do fitted things. And that's a whole nother a ball game if you're doing something to fit and counting the stitches and how many stitches per inch. Um, to me, gauge is the feel. Yeah, it, I teach that too. I teach it's the fabric. You're, you're, uh, in fact, the way I teach is not following a pattern. It's following your swatch, the gauge you like, the how the right fabric uh, drapes, and then you build from that. Yes, I appreciate that. I celebrate that because a lot of teachers, you got to do what the pattern says, or it won't turn out. And um, I've seen sweaters that could stand up on their own without a body in them. Exactly, and that doesn't. <laughs> That doesn't bring justice to your yarn or your the hours you put into it or anything. It just comes out because you follow the rules. So this is blue paste Lester, and then it has a halo, so it drapes. It's beautiful. And it's wonderfully soft. So Merino gets a lot of buzz today, but the blue paste Lester, if you have time, Google it. It's a, a different breed. There's so many breeds today. It's not fuzzy. And it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not fuzzy. Um, here's our newest one. Oh, Charles is on here. Hi, Charles. Hey, Charles. I love him. I do too. <laughs> he went to um, he went to New Zealand, Australia before me, and he gave me some advice. Um, this is Eyes on You by DJ Logan. Um, it's just fun because it has the big, solid eyes. And what you need for that, I have right here, and it's escaped me. But anyway, you need three of the striping yarn. Here it is. Okay. Here, three, two of the striping yarn. And one of the contrast. Isn't that fun? And that's merino. Big green. So it just, and you don't have to put it all over. It could be like this. Okay. So it's just along the border. And then there's some short row eyelet yarn overs. Because if you have a bad time with your short rows and you get spots, then just celebrate it, yarn over, knit two together. And you'll get intentional design holes. Okay. Make it work. Make it work. All right. That's probably enough short row samples. Um, does anybody have, I don't know if they, they can tell you, but if anybody has a swatch. Oh, tell them about weird things you've knit with. Oh, yeah. They, Missy wants me to tell you about all the weird things I knit with. Well, because all of this I do for the shop, you know, I invent patterns and create other people's patterns um, for the store and it keeps the money coming in. Right. But then I need some of my personal time. So I knit with bungee cord and chain link fence and copper wire 
Stephen, Stephen, could you do me a favor and maybe Joy could list the garments that you've shown afterwards? She could send me an email with the list and the yarns that are in them, and I'll post them underneath the video in the description because people are going to ask, "What was it that you? Sure. What was it?" Okay. So here's my um. Here's my videotape sweater. So it's made with all the um, home videotape movies that my mother made of my niece, Jordan, when she was growing up. And, you know, that big old movie camera you held on your shoulder. And, yeah, um, those days are over. I don't have a videotape player anymore. So I transferred them to iCloud or whatever. And I knit the videos into the sweater. And then I made her drapes for her bedroom out of videotape. Um, of her youth. So it's kind of a way to process things from the past. This is, that's what Charles asked. He says, are, you are known for using all manner of material in your work. What is the most unusual or memorable material that you've incorporated? Is it the videotape or do you have something even better? Um, oh, no, it's, I don't know where the sweater is. It's my what? film strip sweater. Oh, I'll get it. Um, it's made with um, 16 millimeter film. Um, I was bullied as a child. Um, I was sent to summer camp, which I hated, boys' summer camp. Um, my dad became the camp director, so I had a bit of a shield. Um, and they filmed everything we did in boys' camp. We went on canoe trips, I learned how to sail and swim and flag, I don't know, cap capture the flag and uh, pitch a tent and all that kind of thing. And they video or they filmed it all. And when the camp closed, my dad got all the canisters of film. Um, so it was a way for me to process my past that wasn't the greatest memories. And you now it's the black and white one. Um, anyway, you'll see it. And so I knit him into a sweater, the film, 16 millimeter film. And you can actually see the little pictures in the film. It's probably hanging on the wall. And um, so now I celebrate it and I enjoy it and I get to tell everybody about it. So something from the past that I could process and turn into a positive. No one else wanted those canisters of film anyway. <laughs> anyway, we can't find it right now. Um, and then this one, this one I did, Lady Gaga came out with a song, because I adore her. Um, because if I could be anybody, I'd be her. And I kind of am of the knitting world. Um, this is made with telephone cord because she came out with that song Telephone with um, Beyonce. Beyonce. So I use telephone cords because remember those? They were attached to the wall and then you'd see how far it stretched and then you had to like twirl it to untangle it. Um, I was asking mom about that today. Oh my God, this one's a great story. So I needed, my st samples were being stolen from the store so I needed to chain them up. I don't know if can you can see it. So I bought a reeling of that bead cord, chain beads, whatever. Let me move it here, okay. And I made a sweater. So I let all the stitches run and then I stitched it around the hole and then I let it hang. And I wore it to Christmas Eve church at this progressive Catholic church um, here in town. I forgot the name of it. And um, this little lady, like 87, little short thing, after service came up to me and um, she pulled on the sweater chain and she said, what happens if I pull this? Will you flush? <laughs> and I just looked at her and I'm like, you're kind of forward. I said, no, pull it harder and you'll turn me on. <laughs> and she just, she just scuttled away. <laughs> oh, I unplugged something. You pulled on, you plugged your light. So that's my chain chain story. Pull my chain, baby. All right. Now we'll do, anybody have a few rows knit? Let's do our demo. Okay, I was gonna turn the camera on if I can. And I know how to do this because I'm gonna go into video. No, that just turned me off. Um, in the screen share into screen share and start sharing. No, that wasn't the right one. Nope. Oh, it's the camera then, it's in the camera.
that wasn't right. And it's not coming up on the camera. Well, there we go. And then you go up to that little thing. Right? Oh, wait, you had to go back. Go there. And then go up there. There's mm. a little arrow. I'm finding it. I practiced this 20 times, but. Okay. <laughs> I know. I, it'll happen. There we go. So um, this is my little Hue camera for close-ups. And, you know, I find it almost impossible to knit with one yarn ever. So I'm not the type of knitter if I were a shopper knitter. We're not would, seeing it. We don't see it yet. Oh, I see it wonderfully. Um, <laughs> And I'm so self-absorbed that, of course, I think you all see Just it. saying the big Skype symbol. Hmm. Okay. Let me try this. If not, I'll hold it up on the other camera. There? Yes, no? Not yet. Okay. Can you see me? No, don't see anything yet. Okay. Now we see you. Okay. Let me try one more time, otherwise I'll skip it. Okay. We practiced earlier. I know it works. Not yet. There? No. All right. I guess we'll skip it then. Shoot, we had to figure it out earlier. I today. know that this happens to me too. It's just, you know, we're live. And I hope people realize that because there's no editing or anything. And so what happens, happens. You know, we just go with the flow and it's okay. All right. So I'm going to show you. You can see me again, right? We can't see you at all. No. There. Now we can see you. Okay. So it's going to be a little more challenging on this camera, but that's okay. And I'll practice again. Yep, you'll get it. Uh, I, always, I always knit on circular needles, FYI. I hardly we even sell a pair of straight needles anymore. And my beginner class that I teach starts on circular needles right away. Um, I converted a few years ago because I didn't have much belief in this straight scarf that you turn and go back. And then inevitably, beginner knitters always pull the stitches up so they keep increasing. Right. And this just circumvents all that. And most of mo most of us will go to circular needles anyway. Right. So why not start there? So I, I have everybody make a cowl. It seems like a wonderful project. And they, can, they make one. And I have them buy. It's not true that because of your beginning or it's just your first project to buy some acrylic yarn that's inexpensive, in my opinion. Buy yourself a treat and make the journey enjoyable. Yes. Um, because, like, for me, like, I don't need one more knit item. I could, you know, it's, I can have it's not about It's not about making the stitches. It's about how does the yarn feel running through your fingers. You know, exactly. if it feels horrible, you're not going to enjoy it. So I always run um, two or three strands together. But this requires knitter's housekeeping, which I call it. So if I've got these, and if you've done this, you've probably gotten frustrated. And there's no frustration needed in knitting so i keep these in a ziploc baggie each of them and every three or four rows i stop and i untwist them it's this here's my analogy thanksgiving dinner everyone's over you've been cooking for six hours they're on the sofa watching TV, the football game you've just been stacking the dishes up on the sink you've served the dinner 20 minutes they've all eaten it they go back to the football game and all you got to do is look at that stack of dishes on the counter. But if you had rinsed the dishes as you went, a pot here, a kettle there, a bowl, a ladle, you'd be almost done. And so keep that in mind when you're with your yarn. Don't make it frustrating. Uh, keep it simple. And it becomes a habit then of constantly straightening. All right. Um, this is my little knit swatch, 30 stitches, 20 stitches, whatever. Um, and so I did a little different right now because of my arthritis. Um, I don't knit the first stitch. I slip it. Um, and then I'm going to knit across 
till I get close to the end. I also don't count my stitches. I mean, the pattern that I'm going to give you counts them. Um, here's another one of my theories. Listen to this. If you never start counting, you never need to count. <laughs> okay, think about that. Um, and you're like, what the hell does he mean? Um, so I do it visually. My eye knows that like on this, about four or five stitches is an inch. Um, here's a note for your short rows. I seldom do them one stitch away from the last short row. It's too steep of an incline and it's harder to hide. So my preference is at least two or three stitches. <clears throat> and some patterns are far much more than that. But um, for the sake of this discussion, I'm just gonna stop here, okay? And we're gonna go into greater detail for instance, how to do it on stockinette stitch, um, different instances. And so with the German short row, you pull it up on the needle, the loop, um, the wrap and turn. Uh, let's see, you slip this stitch head on, you bring it towards you, you put the stitch back and then you turn. All right, so there's a lot of options. Don't know if I got that exactly right, Suzanne. Um, for mine, lazy short rows and the pattern they're called LS, lazy short rows. Um, I have my own language. I stop, I turn, and I, when I'm turning, I bring the yarn, I stop, get that? I gotta do it by the camera, right? Stop, turn, and when I do that, I bring the yarn between the needles, okay? And then I just slip that first stitches up to knit, and I continue back. So the difference on that is, like with the wrap and turn, there's not that loop to pick up when you come back. Right. And I call I call it the mother row, um, the mother row because it it gathers up all the children along the way and makes them behave. Everything I do has got a story behind it, uh, or a, a nursery rhyme, or a, like my casting on. Up the rabbit hole, grab the carrots, bring them down for dinner. Um, so then you always, well, in this case, for this short row, you always knit back to the beginning of your row. And in my pattern, I've counted each row. So on your way there is one row and on your way back is the next row. It simplifies it a bit um, for knitters that are like the other, because sometimes short rows, the back and forth is one row. And that gets confusing. Marie, Marie, she said a Stephen B-ism. If you never start counting, you never need to count. <laughs> mm -hmm. Eyeball it. Here's how I got onto that. Sorry, I digress a hundred times. Here's how I got onto that. I had knitters that would cast on and they'd knit their, and the patterns had knit four rows and they'd knit a couple rows. Then they start yakking and drink coffee and they forget how many rows they knit. And they couldn't quite figure out exactly how many rows it was like, especially in garter, like, is that the cast on road? Does that count as one? And that, and they unraveled it and started over. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, who cares how many rows it is? So then I just, okay, you're not allowed to count anymore ever. <laughs> so does it look like four rows? And which is your right side? You got to decide. So if you do my Mama Krista's cast on, was I supposed to do that today too? Um, my Mama Krista's cast on, the front is very obvious. I mean, even long tail's got an obvious front side. If you decide that's your front side, then for your pattern row, you want to end up with the front side. I okay. call it personal preference. It's whatever you want it to be. Yes, and please learn to read your knitting. What do I mean by that? Um, if your friend illegally copies you a pattern on the mimeograph, I mean the Xerox machine, showing my age, um, and they have to not copy row 35 and 36 on the pattern and you keep going and turn it over and do 37, but you miss 35 and 36, you're like, this doesn't work. Well, did it make sense? <laughs> I mean, you should have figured it out. Um, so really read your knitting. What does it look like? And I, I'll show you my Poncini later. Um, it's a very obvious grid pattern on my Poncini, and it's got yarn overs, knit two together, and the way back, yarn over, purl two together. People, because they're reading the pattern and they get off, will put a yarn over right in the middle of the square. 
because that's what they thought the pattern said. They were not looking at the knitting and they were not looking at the knitting and making it make sense. They weren't stacking the yarn overs. So in that case, if you're not familiar with it, put markers. So you remind yourself that it's got to be between here until you get the hang of it. Um, at, in most patterns, after you've done the first row or two, you should get it and be able to do it on your own from there on out. My, uh, here's another Stephen Bism. A pattern is only a suggestion for me. A pattern is a suggestion. I change the yarn. I change the texture. I change the feel, the gauge, because I want to wear it. Um, if I get bored with a certain pattern in it, I'll change that up. I'll go from garter to seed stitch um, because they're really the same thing. It's just pearl bumps on the other side. Um, Stockinette stitch, seed stitch. You know, seed stitch is just ribbing gotten one off. Right. It's asynchronous my, ribbing. My um, my theory on short rows, here it goes. Uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman, picture this. Wisconsin, log cabin, making her husband soup, winter time. She's knitting along. She sets her knitting down. She goes, steers the soup. She comes back and picks up and goes the wrong way. And she's like, oh my gosh, I just didn't create it, created a dart because that's what a short row is. And you'll see many sweaters out today with the bust line. They pay attention to the bust line and they give you those short rows for the darts. We never had that when I was growing up in the 70s. Nobody put short rows in. It just wasn't a thing. I don't know if you had even heard of them. Uh, so I'm giving credit to Elizabeth Zimmerman. I don't know if it's true or not. I just made it up. Um, but it makes sense. All right. So when you're doing this, you've got these little gullies here, OK? And you're going to do another one, how many ever you want. And I try to stay three to five, two to three stitches at least away from the last one. And my pattern's probably four or five, just to be safe. Okay, so I'm approaching this, I'm approaching this uh, gully here. And so I'm going to stop about right here. And so for your little, um, what I call it earlier, pod shape. It doesn't care whether you've got four or five stitches right there. Can everybody see okay? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I don't care if that's five or six. All right, so then what I do? Claire, do you remember? I simply stop, turn, which brings the yarn to the back, okay, between the needles. And so you're set up to knit again, but you don't want to knit right on top of that last stitch you just knit, so you just slip it. And then you knit back to the beginning. All right, I'm gonna do one more and then we have to move on. This is a teaser, so don't ask me to repeat it. Right, Suzanne, they take, we can take the class. Right. <laughs> anybody um, in the chat, let Missy know if you're interested in the color workshop. I'll schedule another session. Uh, it's already on, okay. and so is your next one. Oh, we have two classes listed. Joy's here. She's like listing it as I mention it because I usually do this to my staff. I talk about things they don't know about that's coming up, and I offer free things like oh, here, 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 like this. Is it? It's not gonna be backwards in here. If you hold it this way, with the explanation point, all caps. Everybody see that? I'll do it one more time before I leave. Um, my patterns, I always do this for Suzanne's group because I appreciate hearing from you. I appreciate um, gathering my patterns. And the key is um, my patterns aren't like everyone else's. They're unique. They're, they're not genius. as classic. Your patterns are genius. Thank you. They're, um, they're not classic. They're, they're experimental. They're artistic. And a lot of the yarns you won't find out there in the average world. So... Um, one of my favorites is Alchemy Silk Straw. Okay, well, the camera's not working. Oh, we'll just turn the computer? Yes. Oh, she's going to hold it. Okay. I hold it. Um, can you do it on the iPad? No. Okay, with my Silk Straw. <laughs> so you see this on the shelf. It's gorgeous. It's sheen. It's luxury. But you don't know what to do with it. Right. And most people in today's 
yarn purchasing way. They, they'll want to buy six or eight skeins of something so they have enough to make a project. Not how I think at all. I, if I were to go shopping, of course, I have the whole shop full, so it makes it easy for me to say. But um, I gather ones and twos. And I collect. And I'll find themes. So um, this is my little theme tray. And these are all my favorite things. And a silk and a mohair together. All alchemy. The colors are just brilliant. Um, this is my new, um, is this French toast? Yep, that's French that's, toast. That's uh, Stephen B. Stephen custom. B color, custom color for me. And I'll put it with a silk. Let me see, there we go. Okay. And most of the time, okay, so here's how I got onto this multiple strand thing. Um, the silk is very slippery and hard to knit with, um, and it can get away from you, which we're going to show you in a minute. Um, and mohair on its own is also thin and fuzzy, and sometimes that annoys people. So you run them together, and when you're knitting, you focus only on the silk. You ignore the mohair, and it just goes along for the trip. And um, the mohair gives the silk stability. And likewise, um, and you can great you can create some great um, um, iridescent colorways. You know how when you put certain colors together to become iridescent, and that's a great way to do it with mohair and silk. So this alchemy silk is genius. Most of my projects just take one or two or three and three different colors, so you don't have to own, own an arsenal of it to have enough. You make it work. And this is my the other one that I adore. This is my. Um, it's my clouds in the sky. See my background on the wall? Um, this is um, a handmaiden from Nova Scotia. And we do these custom. So it's one hank of silk boucle and one hank of mohair. They're dyed simultaneously. But because of the fiber, they pick up the color differently. So you get some dimension to it. However, I don't use these held together because then it would get muddy. Two variegates run together. So always think of that. You need a clarifying yarn, one that highlights. Um, I think if you buy the $64 double bundle, you knit them together, you won't experience the beauty of it. So I'm going to show you quickly my favorite one. Now I got a couple of them. So that's um, one bundle of that. Nope. Wow. A, a lace border. And I cast it. So you can see down here on the lace border, I cast on with both threads. And I feel that your cast on should be plump and hold the shape of the scallop. And then I didn't want it through the whole thing. So I dropped the silk and knit the rest until the lace was gone. Okay. If it says 34 rows, I don't care because I'm going to knit till the yarn's gone. And that avoids all those little balls. Um, and then I put on the silk for the upper portion, which is a uh, flat stockinette. And it's a very long, drapey piece. And then I did this simple, you know, the original shawl. I think Stephen West called it the barnyard? Boneyard, boneyard. That's barnyard. beautiful. Barnyard, where was I? Um, so this is one hank of that. And what you get is the translucent effect of the mohair and the and the thicker yarn. So I use yarns that aren't at all the same gauge right. together. Um, I in one project I may have DK sport yarn, fingering and lace weight, and I pre I choose the appropriate needle and don't change. Mm -hmm. So what I probably do if you're knitting um, a DK on a six or a seven, seven nowadays because I use my DK as a worsted honestly, um, seven or eight. And my fingering's on a one. So I'll pick my needle in between, I'll say four or five. And for my looseness, I'll probably go up to a six. That's how I do, and I know it's hard to get into my head, but um, I want you to see through it. Beautiful. Okay. So that's how those bundles work. And I'm gonna hang them up, which I usually don't do. Um, 
and like here's some more colorways. Okay, they're just beautiful. And you, just, I mean, you almost don't want to use them because they're so beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Now we're gonna have a little demo on those yarns I just showed you. This is for Margot and all her friends. And not a lot. And we love Margot. And we don't want to forget Claire. No, Claire's in there too. This will take like this just is just a minute. A, how much time am I going over? I, no, I, there's I, no, there's no specific time. You're okay. just fine. Okay, see the yarn winder. We can't give you the whole effect because the camera didn't work. But all right. I'm so Joy is my gonna, table. I'm gonna wind. Oh, you're gonna wind. She's my table and my winder. Yeah. You're um, so this is the silk. And we started it out in the Claire. in the okay. crevice. There she's got it. And then as you go along. Keep your toilet paper roll by your yarn winder. People will wonder why. Um, you take a square of toilet paper and you hold it on there and then you continue winding. Yeah, and the swift is working. Yeah. And the, when you wind this, the yarn will eat up the, suck the toilet paper in. And I do it, I'm gonna do it a little quicker now, but I do it until I can't see the toilet paper anymore from the last time. And then, if you get really good, you can just throw them in yeah. as you're winding. But, um, and you just, it doesn't matter if it's straight on yeah. or not. Don't, 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 what? Don't pull, we're done. Okay. <laughs> so, you continue with that as you wind the whole thing, and maybe every 30 to 40 rounds, you add the toilet paper in. What it does is forms an inner cone, and there you go. Look at Claire. And she listens somewhere along the way. Um, <laughs> Let me put her on there. And um, it gives the yarn stability and it won't all collapse and become a knotted mess. I do with this with anything that is delicate, slippery, um, out of control. Hold it up. And so as so you can see how that works, I, one of these days I got to put a video up on my on my YouTube channel. Um, but you can go on my YouTube channel and watch my reality show that I did with Stephen West. It's really funny. It has not much to do about knitting. Um, so this is a great way to make a really structured skein of yarn. And at all times, please put them in a Ziploc baggie to keep them together or a net, something like this, that. This has stayed neat for three years. Yep. Years. <laughs> so, um, cause I have people that come in and the yarn's all tangled and fell off the ball and oh, I'm not here to untangle your yarn. Um, I do it with mohair usually too. The only ones I don't do it with like a classic worsted or something that's a traditional yarn. Has everybody got their little swatch done if so, they did uh, it? Uh, 37 Vega Lira wants to know, how do you resolve the lazy short row? Short that's what I'm doing. I have to put digressions in, otherwise you wouldn't be wanting for anything. <laughs> um, so I, I've got my two um, children here, my, gu my gullies. All right, so this is really, can, I do, can you see like that? No. Yes, you can do it like that. All right, so I'm just gonna knit my stitches and pretend I probably had actually five gullies would be the, you know, something like that. I think that's what it is in my pattern. So you're knitting up to the gully and when you're knitting, you knit exactly up to the gully. Well, now I can hear myself. Um, you don't, don't leave one stitch, okay? like the wrap and turn somehow that pops into people's heads when you one stitch no you knit up to that last okay so see how your right side is like an apartment building higher than the left side right your your, your right hand's in the way okay there see how you're right it's like two-story apartment building is higher than the right side a uh, left side the right side is higher than the left side mm -hmm. so you don't take the needle you're knitting with. You take the other needle, the left hand needle. And what you do is you go in and pick the bump up right here, this garter bump from the row below. I can't see to get it in there. There we go. Um, and see, I put on the needle. So it's the garter bump from the row below, not the one you just did up here, because that, not this loop, because then you'd be in the same stitch. Right. So, and not this one down here because that's the same row you were already on. Right. It's got to be you turned. one. It's where it's you turned. It's got to be one where you turned. Yes. So simply go in and you get the closest bump to the edge. And you know what? If you're not exact, who cares? But um, 
I get this bump here. If I could see it, I think I I bought fashion glasses instead of utilitarian glasses. Um, let me do it this way. So when you've got that bump picked up, and it's not that hard as I'm making it. Um, okay, so you pick it up, and then you simply knit two together. So those of you that have done wrap and turn, you can see this bump that I picked up is really your wrap and turn. Right. It's it's you know what? It takes the same exact thing as a wrap and turn, exactly uh -huh. the same. You would not be able to tell the difference. Right. I love the that. difference is the difference is, and this is really technical because my mind does that. I just don't want to let you know that. Um, is that because you're picking up this bump here, it's kind of tight. Mm -hmm. You didn't wrap it around here. So you're taking a few millimeters of yarn out of that loop and your wrap and turn will be tighter. Right. I like this. This is going to be my new short row method. So then you go in and with continue knitting your row, but you're going to go in and take your stitch with the picked up bump and knit them together. And I'm guaranteeing you, you'll never see the glitch because that loop is not big. It's very tight. And so I'm going to do that again. And that's all the teaser I've given you. And then we'll do it. It's a little more, it's a little different with stockinette. I, saw, I feel like I'm on an infomercial selling you a deal. Um, so I knit up to the gully, knit up to the gully, right? Then my bump is really obvious here. And I'm going to pick it up with my left needle. Everybody gets it confused. Not the right needle you're knitting on. The left needle. But then because you picked up that bump, you have to get rid of it. Otherwise, you'll increase. Right. Which you could do. Um, so right away, all you do, it's so simple. All you do is knit the two together and continue on your way. And the reason I, I mean, I, I work with, Steve, we did this in our classes, Stephen. Look at that. That's perfect. So the reason, um, Stephen West has a lot of short rows. And we're like, wait a minute. If I don't do that wrap and turn, and it's the same as the bump over there, why am I going through all that transferring? So we just got lazy. What's he call it? He, call, he uses it all the time. He calls it something not lazy short row because he's not lazy. Um, he's prolific. Um, so and then you finish your row. And then in the pattern, so you put a bump over here, a pod. And then I'm thinking, even if you get off in sequence, then I'm going to pop next time. I'll put a pod on this side. OK, and then I'll put a pod in the middle to balance it out. And then ultimately, they balance each other, so you end up back on a straight row. Okay. Okay. So that's how I think. And um, this, the red to the red is one repeat. But see how if you use different yarns, it all looks like it's one complicated pattern, and it's not. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's bring Claire on. Let's bring Claire on. It's Claire's turn. She's okay. been sitting there patiently. Bring Claire, on. Claire, I love your um, poncho. Let me put mine on too. Thank you. My mom made it. I made the neck, but mom made the rest. <laughs> okay. Of course, I had to put tassels on mine. Oh, yeah. Mom made yes. some tassels. I mean, I'm probably the only yarn shop that sells leather tassels, so. <laughs> Can, 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 do you mind if Claire? Do you mind if Claire tells the story about her mother? I'd love it. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, uh, my mom recently passed away at the end of December, at the age of eighty-five, and had lived a little, a few hours away from me. But she moved up to Bakersfield, two thousand fifteen. And then in 2017, Stephen came to Bakersfield to do um, a workshop. Fashion, a workshop, yes. It was a Which couple Suzanne of days. Which organized and didn't come. I know. That's what, I had a mental breakdown <laughs> instead. <laughs> yeah, so we were all scrambling, but we pulled it all together in time for Stephen to get there. And I um, asked my mother to come with me to the fashion show that Stephen was doing. My mother used to knit a long time ago. And um, by the time the third or fourth kid came along of five, 
she uh, didn't have much time to knit anymore. So I encouraged her to come and I had been encouraging her to come with me to my local knitting guild and our meetings and to knit again. She finally did. She came to Stephen's fashion show and she was just so inspired. She's very much like Stephen, um, you know, just mixing colors, loves things that are askew and bright and sparkly. So um, because of that, she got started knitting again. So I got to see her more often, even though we're living in the same town, it was clear across town. So I got to see her more often. And the most important thing, and I was sharing with Stephen earlier today, is that um, my friends, all my knitting friends came to know my mother and me and see how much I was like her. And um, I, I think they enjoyed her a lot too. So when she passed, my knitting friends were a big support to me. And it's a treasure that I have friends around me in Bakersfield who know my mother. And that's all due to Steven. So thanks. Um, you're going to make me cry. Yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> I cry easily. Yeah, I have no so, shame in crying. Thank you so much for that story. You're welcome. And this is one of the things uh, that was most inspiring. So she made it. And um, I don't know if I inherited all her knitted garments that she made after that, but I took them. Okay. <laughs> and that's made with Caracool from Malabrigo uh -huh. and some um, other yarns in between. And this is a great way. And this is going to be my next class on the 29th. It's called Knit It in a Minute. Um, because it's about bulky yarns that people avoid buying, especially if you're in Bakersfield at 104 degrees. Yeah. Um, but it's because, again, we think, oh, I'm going to buy eight skeins of chunky yarn and it's going to be heavy and I'll be too hot and I'm going through that time of life and um, it's going to make me look heavy and all those reasons not to buy bulky. And the thing is, I just buy enough bulky as an accent. That was two skeins, yeah. I think. Some of my projects yeah. are just one, one skein and it's 90 <laughs> yards. Uh, so this gives you, again, an opportunity to use up yarn you maybe collected and don't know what to do with. And um, mine, of course, has a pom-pom on it as a corsage. Yes, and well, I, I can add that. But um, if you can see mine, the chunky yarn probably calls for a 17 or a 15. And then what I've held together are two lace strands. But I don't change the needle. There you go. The tra translucency. Um, <laughs> Where was I? I wore it over my head because, and I could see, still see through it. I don't know. Anyway, um, the translucency is created by using a larger needle. And between the chunky yarns, I usually only do, oh, because I work on circulars, so you can slide it back and forth, whatever row you're on, um, anywhere from three to six rows only, because the chunky yarn makes the thin yarn behave. And it keeps it stretched out, which gives you the translucency. If you knit longer, it'll start collapsing on itself and it won't do the project justice. Um, but I don't know, when I was young in the 70s, we kind of called it, when we changed the needle, we call it condo knitting. And you knit with two different size needles. And I was like, oh, that's silly. So I just knit it on the same needle. Anyway, keep the same needle size throughout. That's my um, Knit It in a Minute project. And. The one that will be working on to complete and have the kit ready for this. And this is, um, keep in mind, this is what I call a shark. And I don't wear it symmetrically. I put it in front. I'm not, I'm not the shawl wearer like Whistler's mother like this. Okay. Some of you may be. It's a classic way to wear a shawl, right? Fine. But I like it as a shawl is now a scarf because I don't knit many straight panels and put fringe on each end and give someone a scarf anymore. I do a cowl or I do a shawl. So I coined the phrase shark, coined the phrase sharp, shawl, scarf, right? So this is my shark and I put tassels on the point and I drape it decoratively, okay? Sharp. And if your shawl turns out too big and it's large and you can cover up, it's a schlanket. <laughs> okay. And if your cowl is up on your shoulders and you accidentally or you intentionally pull it down and wears a skirt and put a belt on it, it's a scowl. Skirt cowl. So 
um, you can morph your projects into many more. Meanwhile, Claire, what would you like to know from Steven's crystal ball? Um, well, I have, my stash is sort of, my stash, my uh, fine arts collection of fiber has evolved to almost eliminate the bulky yarns. Maybe I should bring them back in. So now I have a lot of fingering weight and DK. And so if, if you don't have bulky yarn, how can you make something that pops as though it, it did? Some of your yarn. Let's hold yeah. some. Hold them up like one at a time. So first of all, put the purple on that you were um, making shoulder pads out of earlier. <laughs> Here's all my purple. Okay, lovely purple. But if you put purple on top of purple. Well, yeah, you can't really see that. So. You're just going to be purple. Because yeah. you got a purple top on. So we all know that you like purple. Right. Okay, so <laughs> well, you were saying that nobody has yellow. Yes, Claire, you've got enough purple. We all know you like purple. Time to start popping it, right? Okay. So probably some of the people's most difficult colors to deal with are yellow and orange. And, I mean, there's complete orange lovers, Suzanne. Um, <laughs> and Joy. That is not a problem. But... When you're coming to and you're spending two hundred dollars for a sweater, people vacillate like, "Oh, I love that color, but I'm not going to spend two hundred thirty dollars to make a sweater out of it because I, I don't know if I'll wear it." So, um, I really encourage you then to look at the opportunity of that color and where you could use it. So, I like holding yarns together. So for instance, if I had um, two yarns, I'll hold the strands together, not the skeins, and I'll see how they blend and if it's too contrasty i'll try another option um so when you put your colors together uh, the first step for you claire is to go through some magazines artful living leisure time whatever that one is um vogue magazine and just go through and look at mostly advertis advertisements or oh i just turned british advertisements or um um, National Geographic's great because of all the great photography. And just pull out pictures that speak to you. Okay? I, I do do that. Then you lay those down and you look at them and because they've inspired you, you hold the yarns around those. And it'll help you learn to blend colors. Mm -hmm. and it's really magical. Um, and that's how I store my yarn now, by theme. By theme. Right. Um, well, I'm going to show you a sample that kind of is, a, is would it be a great project for you. It's like a project. Okay. 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 Joy's going to help me find it. It was right here a minute ago. It was the seaweed one. Oh, here it is. I found it. Okay. So I showed this last time, Susan. But, um, <laughs> If I make a project and the um, estrogen, okay. Okay, so this is lovely. This is the striped estrogen, and I use two fingerings. So uh, Claire, you can see here, if you have two fingerings, they should not match. This is turquoise, and the other one was like a purple peacock, okay? And so I contrast them in garden stitch, and if you pull them apart, you can see them. Uh huh. And you can certainly use up colors that don't even go together, go this well together. You could use totally dissonant colors. Mm -hmm. Because this is like a Monet painting of pointillism. When you look up close and you stretch it out, you can see it. And when you hold the two skeins together, you're gonna hear, this doesn't match, okay? Uh -huh. But when you move away from them, it's like a Monet painting. All of a sudden you see the pond and the lady with the parasol. Mm -hmm. uh, and it becomes a visual stimulation rather than an individual, um, you know, picking it apart individually. And this is what I'm talking about, any variations you may have knit into it too, because it blends into the magnificent whole that your eye blends, your eye does it for you. Mm -hmm. and this is your opportunity. It called, this called for three skeins of fingering. Well, I don't buy the same of anything. So in this one, I have one yarn that's a twist stock yarn fingering and I have one that's a single uh -huh. 
because I love the texture play of those two yarns. So that way I'm not worried if the store has enough. They're not all the same. I don't care if they're the same label or not. I just pick what I like. And then I chose this yarn from Alchemy, which is the same silk of wrapped in gold. Okay, and it's very stiff and it's crunchy, but that melts away as you knit because it's got a sizing on it. And then you get this wonderful border, Chantilly lace. Um, and it changes the whole, if you look at this pattern online, Stephen West, it won't look anything like this because I've changed its personality by my choice. And this is a lace yarn. It's a lace yarn. And again, the thick yarn, the fingering is holding the lace out and making it behave. Right, right. So don't be scared of your gauges. Start mixing them. Right. Yeah, I I um I actually feel pretty good about my my colors. I'm not afraid to mix some things. I every single one of my skeins is is um, not my baby, but like my children. That okay. I love them all. Um, do you have any that you don't that you're not sure about? Do I have anything that I'm not sure about? Show the one you showed me earlier. The one with the yeah, one. that I want. Oh. Um, there's this one, uh, Apple Fiber Studio Salmon Run, and yes, sometimes I buy a skein of yarn because of the name, right. but I do actually love all these colors. This is a teal. You don't know how many names I have, yarn I sold because of the name. We yeah. do a collection of nerd yarn named after great shows, and that, that all sells. Okay, so I'm going to give you, I'm going way over, but I'm um, sorry. Um, I'm going to give you an idea for that one. Okay. okay. So... Back to my point on this one is that I picked all blues and greens that coordinated well together, right? And it just looks like a peacock feather, okay? That, that's pretty obvious. And you can all do that on your own. Maybe not changing the yarn out, but the colors you're, you're pretty good. But here's what you do when you take that same yarn combination mm -hmm. and you use all those yarns you have on the table. Oh, wow, yeah. The be sweet, the mohair, the novelty, the sparkle. And I'm gonna go down from one end to the other. So this is after you've mastered my lazy short rows and you've got the sink of making pods, okay? And then you just go off on your own. So there's no pattern to this. It's in my more um, advanced short row class. Okay? Because once you get the hang of it, I'm not making anything symmetrical, sorry. And then Barban actually did this sample for me. And um, so I've got all my mixtures of yarn. There's DK, there's lace weight, and of course there's fingering. And then who knows what weight these novelty yarns are, right? Um, and see how I knit along? And when I was got too big, I just bound off. And I went down to a more manageable size. And I kept making my pods. Remember I said how to balance them? Where you have one side heavy and then you balance it with one on the other. Mm -hmm. That's you get the feeling of the swing knitting because it goes back and forth and fills in the void. And then I knit along and look at that. I did some um, yarn over knit twos together so I get some lace. And this is where I use, and then the end is just fun and drapey and seaweed. I call it seaweed. Seaweed, that's great. And here's where I use the yellow and the orange with all my peacock colors. And Quite honestly, most people don't walk up to the counter and check out with this combination because the yellow and orange are not the obvious choice. Um, but be a, bit, a little bit experimental. And what your eye does again is blends it all together in a harmony of colors. And actually the orange and the yellow pop the other colors so you can appreciate the blues and greens that are in there. Mm -hmm. Put some of your purples up there against that. Say. Okay, so the project I suggest for this salmon run, and I'm doing this quickly, um, is this one. And it can be done with any shawl. And it's short rows. Okay, ready for this? Yes. Um, this is my class that I do where you can use no written pattern. You get a piece of wrapping paper, uh, brown paper, on a roll and you have to draw your shape and then you have to knit to the shape. And this is where you need to read your knitting. Okay, so I've got this trapezoid. 
Ooh. Oh, that would be stunning, Claire, like that. Okay, so uh, you draw it on your brown paper, and you draw it out, and then I drew three design lines in it. Okay? Uh -huh. And that design line was, Joy's going to hold it out a bit. That design line is where I changed the color. Mm -hmm. So, um, then you pick where to start from. You can start from a point. I chose to start on this edge right there. <laughs> And th this has become Stephen West's pattern called Smooth Move. I got to give him credit. And when I say sparkle, some people go, oh, no, I'm not a sparkle person. I'm like, okay, get over yourself. Um, oh, can you take something out of the till? Or, um, sparkle, but there's sparkle here. And it's not a disco ball. And I'm going from glitter to shimmer now. As we've endured many complications in life and, and so everything that's going on, I'm just shimmering right now. Plus, they said all that glitter ends up in the sea plastic. So we're going to shimmer. Um, and I knit the shimmer um, white uh, between the black. That's just white and black, huh? So the black diffused the shimmer. So the answer is, if you have something that's very sparkly, diffuse it with mohair or alternating it, and it will become a shimmer. So glitter becomes a shimmer. All right? And that was the way, and when I'm standing like this, remember the Monet theory, mm -hmm. it just becomes part of a greater whole. Um, this one was, uh, I had a gray yarn, and you can't really tell in there, but it was lavender gray. It was a weird shade, and it just didn't work with anything. So I put it between this black and white speckle yarn, hand dyed. And now your eye perceives it as a group of grays and black and ivory. Yeah. And this is where your salmon run comes in, Claire. I have this stain of hand dyed that someone made for me. And it was it's rust fuchsia and gray. And I was like, what do I do with this? You know, it was like way back when indie dyers were just starting out. And it wasn't my color palette. So what do you do? I diffused it with ivory. Oh. Or in your case, you could diffuse it with gray, or you could go really crazy and put hot pink between it and make it just launch into space. <laughs> um, okay, so if you walk up to the checkout counter at your local yarn shop with these six skeins, they're gonna look at you and like, what are you gonna make with that? And you're saying, I could make a shawl because Stephen B said I could. Yes. And then they'll go, oh, yeah, of course, him. But um, <laughs> <laughs> if you only knew. <laughs> the beauty of it is this kind of knitting makes every yarn you have work. Yes. So be inspired. And Thank you. not sure. I mean, it's even beautiful. Like that navy in front would be beautiful. Is that navy? I can't tell. Purple. It's, um, it's it's a navy so dark it's or a purple so dark it's almost navy. Oh, I love that's my favorite. Okay, my two favorite neutrals are olive green and um, eggplant. So yeah. instead of always going to black, I go to eggplant now. Right. Instead of I always don't... going to any kind of any kind of a shade of beige or taupe, I yeah. go to olive. Yeah. And so it's neutral with a bit of color, and then. The new one that really works is the very soft pink. What do I call it? Um, I was inspired by my trip to Japan because everybody was wearing that pink. But it's like ballet pink. Ballet pink, that really soft. It's my other neutral. So instead of ivory, I'll use that pink. Oh, that's a great idea. Misty. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my theory on your stash. And in, you know, they don't have to be both fingering. You could use mohair between one. Mm -hmm. Or play. Ooh. So mix this it up. This is turquoise mohair. Blend it up. Um, what else do I need to cover? I didn't do Mama's Christmas cast on. Maybe we'll do that next time. Yes, and there will be a next time. There's a video on Mama Christmas cast on if you go on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But it's not as good as me doing it in person. I'm going to, let's do, um, Claire, I'm going to take you off the screen. Thank you for joining Thank you, Claire. Okay, thank That's you. Not, uh, the challenge. We can do this for someone awesome. else. Hey, okay. thanks, yes, Stephen. Thank Bye, Suzanne. My dear, thank you for that story. You're welcome. And I think we'll wrap it up, Stephen. This has been yeah. so awesome, and we do have to do this again. I've got so many things to show you. 
Um, I got the table full and I've got a rack full of samples, so we have to come back. Yes, we'll do it again. And you'll have more classes then, too, that you can talk about because you're going to be an expert at virtual classes. Yes. Um, well, Lord knows I have the personality to do it. So if I can just get the te tech down, I'll be fine. Exactly. That's all you have to do. And it's if I can do it, you could do it. Let me yeah. Because I'm not, I'm a knitter. I'm not a tech person, but I had to learn all of this. You know, I, I'm so impressed by you, honestly. Um, again, for Suzanne, go for technique and the process. And for me, come for inspiration and stepping outside the box. And Exactly. Uh, and my motto right now, and, and I send out all the kits, I forgot to say, expect, expect the unexpected. Um, because that's what all these kits are. It's like, and they're going to open the kit and go, what the hell do I do with this? <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah. It really sets you free. Yeah. So, Stephen, be it. Take it further than it was intended to go. Um, go to your website, sign up for your newsletter, and you'll find out about the classes through that, right? You're going to put, you have yeah. a newsletter? Yeah. It'll be coming out again. And every we send out emails often, and if you don't feel like reading it, just ignore it and move on to the next day. Right. Uh, because we have a lot of products to sell and a lot of ideas. And our emails all come with a picture of what we suggest you make and our version of the yarn. Yeah. Not what the pattern calls for. So it's all, and like right now, we're doing Casa Pinka's Knit Along on the 9th, 7th, 7th. Um, and all of my kits are one of a kind curated by me. And you know what? Once you get through Mama Krista's yarn and get it inventoried and everything, you're going to have a virtual, I mean, you're going to have a classic yarn collection. Classic yarn. No one else. Well, I've seen people selling vintage fabrics, so I might as well sell vintage yarn. And one more thing. My favorite thing in her stash, and they're in my basement because I'm keeping them under lock and key. Spinner and made a big box like this, and they it was for a mini dress in Mona wool. Mona was the best wool back then. It was a, They called it cable twist. And Mona, and it came in bright colors, and you knit the dress, and the box included a pair of go-go boots to, mat, to go with the yarn. So not only do I have, I also have a museum. Right, exactly, really. It's my house, three-story Victorian, and it's filled to the rafters. Yes, I, 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 would, I would love to come visit and see that yarn. Let me tell you. I have you. a room for you. It's got a fireplace and um, <laughs> a 18th century French bed that I shipped over from Paris. <laughs> Hey, I can I can I offer my services too, Stephen? Sure. Yeah, let me get you on here. Where'd you go? I've got oh, a big front nice. porch. Where, Does anybody um, have questions? Quick before we go. Yeah. I'm uh, by training. I'm a librarian, and by just ge genetics, genetically speaking, I'm an organizer. So, Joy. Oh, Who's you? Oh my God. If you ever want somebody to come to your shop and organize your stash because it sounds like it's huge I, I just found this gentleman who's obsessive compulsive so he's sorting yes. all of i have wait i can show you this quick sorry i, I, I go on and on susan um oh let me get me off of here i'm gonna remove claire i'm sorry claire it's okay remove <laughs> me so people can see this oh that's cool this is my um it's SBCCF, Stephen B. Creative Community Foundation. And Missy um, helped me establish it about eight years ago, seven or eight years ago. And we did it because we live in a very diverse neighborhood, uh, not a wealthy suburb. Um, and it's got its challenges and it's got its beauty. And um, that's because I'm kind of an oddball. I didn't want to live yeah. in where all the houses were beige. And so I bought this old firehouse and turned it into my yarn shop, and I wanted to include a foundation. So what we do is a lot of times people will come by and they're looking for a place to donate their yarn. We collect yarn and needles. We repackage it and give the kits away. So this obsessive compulsive gentleman is sorting all my needles, and then we're doing knitting kits to give away. So one day a week, one day a month, I'll have free knitting kits out in the front patio, encouraging people that – maybe don't have the means or are scared to invest right now in money and yarn that they have an opportunity to knit as well. That's one fold of the foundation. The other is that we do hats for those that need them. 
It used to be hats for the homeless, but now it's really anybody that needs something warm and comforting. And it's taken on a greater scope. We did, uh, Barb Mellum started this with me and um, we did almost 3,000 hats last year. Ooh. And so it, it started as my birthday's Christmas Eve and Lord knows I don't need one gift. So, so is my mom, Stephen. Oh my God, that's even wilder. I tell you, it's amazing. A few more. Anyway, <laughs> it was my way of giving back on my birthday. So we started handing them out on Christmas Eve. And third fold is we collect throughout the year for the foundation, and then we write a check to a uh, someone in need, some venture in the neighborhood that needs funding. Um, so it's Stephen B. Creative Community. So it stays creative in the community, and um, that's where all our donations go. And our, we're, our go to our giving page because it had Joy just did that, and it, you'll see the variety of people that we donate to in the neighborhood. That's awesome. And we just redid the website a bit, so there's lots of stuff on. Thank you so much for this opportunity. As you can see, I can go for hours. It's okay. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you. you know? oh, gosh. And anybody that send us an info ad if you want to join the class, it's coming up. And otherwise, you can go online and sign up. I want to take the short road class, so I'll, I'll look for it on there. I think that's okay. really fun. Really Great. Fun. And then go out of your box and hold two strands together and keep changing one at a time. Yep. Okay, we're awesome. going to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you. Bye, Stephen. Bye, Stephen. Great weekend. And a great weekend. Be sure to share this video with your friends. Once this is finished, it goes on to face. I mean, on YouTube, and it's there permanently. You can hit the share button and share it with your social media groups on Facebook or anywhere where you are and um, spread the word. So that helps get the information out. It helps Stephen reach more people, uh, helps him with his business, and he can teach more classes and make more people happy just like he's made you happy today. So we'll see you next time. Happy knitting. Love you all.